And now it's time for Silly Songs with Laddie, the part of the show where Laddie comes out and sings a silly song. One day, while talking with Dr. Archibald, Laddie confronts one of his deepest fears. If my lips ever left my mouth, packed a bag and headed south, that'd be too bad. I'd be so sad. I see, that'd be too bad. You'd be so sad. That'd be too bad. Alrighty. If my lips said adios, I don't like you, I think you're gross, that'd be too bad. I might get mad. Hmm, that'd be too bad. You might get mad. That'd be too bad. Fascinating. If my lip moved to the loose, left a mess and took my tooth, that'd be too bad. I'd call my dad. Oh dear, that'd be too bad. You'd call your dad. That'd be too bad. Hold it! Did you say your father? Fascinating! So what you're saying is, if your lips left you... That'd be too bad, I'd be so sad, I might get mad, I'd call my dad. That'd be too bad. That'd be too bad. That'd be too bad. Why? Because I love my lips. Oh my, this is more serious than I thought. Laddie, what do you see here? Um, that looks like a lip. What about this? It's a lip. And this? It's a lip, it's a lip, it's a lip, 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 it's a lip, it's a lip, it's a lip, 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 it's a lip, it's a lip, it's a lip, 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 lip. Laddie, tell me about your childhood. When I was just two years old, I left my lips out in the cold and they turned blue. What could I do? Oh dear, they turned blue. What could you do? Oh, they turned blue. I see. On the day I got my tooth, I had to kiss my great aunt Ruth. She had a beard, and it felt weird. My, my, she had a beard, and it felt weird. She had a beard. Oh. Ten days after I turned eight, got my lips stuck in a gate. My friends all laughed, and I just stood there until the fire department came and broke the lock with the crowbar, and I had to spend the next six weeks in lip rehab with this kid named Oscar who got stung by a bee right on the lip, and we couldn't even talk to each other until the fifth week because both of our lips were so swollen, and when he did start speaking, he just spoke Polish, and I only knew like three words in Polish, except now I know four because Oscar taught me the word for lip. Usta. Your friends all laughed. Usta. How do you spell that? I don't know. So what you're saying is that when you were young... They turned blue, what could I do? She had a beard and it felt weird, my friends all laughed. whoop -da. I'm confused. I love my lips! This has been Silly Songs with Laddie. Tune in next time to hear Laddie say... Have I ever told you how I feel about my nose? Oh, look at the time! Bye, ba boo ba billy ba ba dee ba dee ba boo ba billy ba ba dee ba. And now it's time for silly songs with Larry, the part of the show where Larry comes out and sings a silly song. Our curtain opens as Larry, having just finished his morning bath, is searching for his hairbrush. Having no success, Larry cries out. Oh, where is my hairbrush? Oh, where is my hairbrush? Oh, where, 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 Back there is my hairbrush. Back there, back there, oh, where, back there, oh, where, oh, where, back there, back there, back there is my hairbrush. Having heard his joyous proclamation, Junior Asparagus enters the scene. Shocked and slightly embarrassed at the sight of Larry in a towel, Junior regains his composure and comments, Why do you need a hairbrush you don't have any hair? Larry is taken aback. The thought had never occurred to him. No hair? What will this mean? What will become of him? What will become of his hairbrush? Laddie wonders. No hair for my hairbrush. No hair for my hairbrush. No hair, 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 no back there, no hair. For my hairbrush. Having heard his wonderings, Bob the Tomato enters the scene. Shocked 
shocked and slightly embarrassed at the sight of Larry in a towel, Bob regains his composure and confesses, Larry, that old hairbrush of yours. Well, you never use it. You don't really need it, so... Well, I'm sorry. I didn't know. But I gave it to the peach, because he's got hair. Feeling a deep sense of loss, Larry stumbles back and laments. Not fair. Oh, my hairbrush. Not fair. My poor hairbrush. Not fair, not fair, no hair, not fair, no wear, no hair, not fair, not fair, not fair. My little hairbrush. Having heard his lament, the peach enters the scene. Himself in a towel, both Larry and the peach are shocked and slightly embarrassed at the sight of each other. But recognizing Larry's generosity, the peach is thankful. Thanks for that hairbrush. Yes, good has been done here. The peach exits the scene. Larry smiles, but still feeling an emotional attachment for the hairbrush, calls out, Take care of my hairbrush. Take care. Oh, my hairbrush. Take care, take care, don't dare not care, take care, nice hair, no fair, take care, take care of my hairbrush. The end. Hi, kids, and welcome to Veggie Tales. I'm Bob the Tomato. And I'm Larry the Cucumber. And we're here to answer your questions. Yep. Now, this week, we got a letter from Pete McGinnis in Newcastle, Indiana. Hey, Pete. Pete writes, Dear Bob and Larry, I'm depressed. All my friends are in Mrs. Peterson's class, but I got stuck in Mr. Schubert's class. If God loves me, why do bad things happen? Your friend, Pete. Wow, that's a tricky one. Sure is. Well, Pete, I know a Bible story that I think could help you a lot. Uh, Bob? Uh, yeah? I thought we were going to do a western this time. Uh, a what? A western. You know, with cowboys and tumbleweeds and little doggies. You promised we could, right before I went to cowboy camp. Uh, <laughs> I think what Pete needs here is a Bible story, Larry. You promised, Bob. Uh, promised? Did I really say promise? Yes, you did, Bob. Uh, I really think we need to do a Bible story. A Western, Bob. A Bible story. A Western, Bob. <gasps> Can we have a second? Well, after a bit of discussion, Larry and I have decided that what you really need, Pete, is a Western Bible story. That's right. So, without further ado... The Ballad of Little Joe. A long, long time ago, way out in the West somewhere... That's right, the West. There lived a group of brothers. Cowboy brothers. Uh, right. Uh, cowboy brothers. Hello, little doggies. With French accents. What? It's a French western. Uh, okay. Uh, anyway, uh, there was Reuben. Oh, ho. Simeon. Bonjour. Levi. Adi. Izzy. Yahoo. Zeb. Bravo. Gad. Yes, Ash. Yahoo. Dan. Hey, my dog. Natty. Et toi. Oh, and Jude. Hey, Jude! Hey. Uh, then there was uh, Baby Ben, but he was too little to come outside. <coughs> oh, and one more. <coughs> little Joe. Look who finally decided to get up! Hey guys, where do you hear about the crazy dream I had last night? Quiet, Little Joe, we are working here. Oh, right. Little Joe was a little different than the others. Besides talking differently, God had given him great organizational abilities. You should see his sock drawer. What kind of work are you doing, exactly? We must count our sheep, but every time we do. Well, maybe it wouldn't be so boring if you put the sheep in groups of five or ten. Then, you just have to count the groups. I bet you'd have your work done in no time. What a ridiculous idea! You know nothing about sheep! I'll put them in groups of ten. So, can I tell you about my dream now? Come and get it! 
<laughs> Not so fast, fellas. Before we eat, I have a special announcement. I think we all know that today is Little Joe's birthday. Papa. Baked it myself. All together. We agree on something. <gasps> For me? Well, what are you waiting for? Try it on! What do we get for our birthday present? Mittens. Little Joe is wearing a vest made from the finest calf hides. Perfect for riding the range or going a courting. This is one vest that says, look at me, I'm something special. And what do mittens say? They say, you are not as special as your brother. And for my birthday wish, I want to tell you all about my latest dream. It was the strangest thing. Past the mountains in the fields where the cowboys practice. Out beneath the desert sky stood a dozen cactus. Cactuses? Cacti? Cacti? Continue. Eleven cactus, those were you, gathered round the other. They bowed, you see, to the one that was me. Their dearest little brother. Their dearest little brother. Crazy, huh? What are you saying? That you will rule over us like a king? <laughs> it was just a dream, right? It's not really gonna happen. <laughs> uh, maybe you should cut down on the bratwurst before bed, huh? Needless to say, Joseph's dreams didn't make his brothers like him any better. Hey, why are we at this whole abandoned mine shaft? Uh, this is where we hid your birthday present. Wow. Very, uh, creative. It's time to get what you've got coming to you. Oh, I can't wait. I don't see a birthday present. You are not looking hard enough. Okay. No, I still don't see anything. Well then, how about now? Whoa! A goat must have bumped me or something. Little help? We left you, but we're too busy bowing down before you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys, this isn't funny. Really? It made me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, who's that? What are you guys doing? Come on, joke's over. Ha ha, real funny. Guys? Guys? Tie this around your middle. Who are you? Never you mind. Just tie the rope. Well, finally. Oh, dear. Hey, desperados! You better come to your senses! <laughs> didn't know where he was or where he was going. He'd never been away from the ranch before, and now here he was on the run with dangerous men. Ah, uh, Mr. Desperado, did you put out the campfire last night?
getting shorter every week. Here you go, boss. Oh, and uh, by the way, the peanuts make them thirsty, so get ready to sell a lot of root beer. Oh, you're a natural, me lad. And that's why you've earned this. I wasn't sure if you'd work out when I bought you from those desperados. But congratulations, me lad. Employee of the month? Oh, thank you, Mr. McPotifer. I won't let you down, you'll see. From now on, I'll work harder than ever. C'est Joseph. Oh, hello, kitty. That's Miss Kitty to you. Whatever you say. Look, little Joe, don't be a sap. No one's looking. Take this money and get out of here. Why would I do that? You and I both know you don't want to be here. With this much cash, you can get back home. I'm sorry, Miss Kitty, but stealing is wrong. If I took that money, I'd be disobeying God. Not to mention I'd probably lose my status as employee of the month. Good day, Miss Kitty. <laughs> uh, to show you there's no hard feelings about you know what, I made some alterations to your costume for you. Oh, well, that's really kind of you, but I wasn't aware that it would <laughs> It's a tad heavier than before. <laughs> I put some extra stuffing in it. Thief! <gasps> There's a thief among us! All right. What seems to be the trouble here? This man has been stealing from dear old McPotifar since the day he arrived here. Little Joe? This does not look good. <gasps> Joe, me lad! Oh. What do you have to say for yourself? I'm innocent? Tell it to the judge. Hi, everyone. This is Larry. Normally, this would be the time when the narrator comes on and says, And now it's time for Silly Songs with Larry, the part of the show where Larry comes out and sings a silly song. But... I've been thinking, and talking with the guys. And we've decided it's time to broaden our scope. Artistically. Yeah, we're artists! Word up! 
There's a time to be silly, and there's a time to be serious. It's time to open up your heart and show how you feel, artistically. Cause we all have something to share. to you. You've got the best attitude of any prisoner I've ever had. God is good, Sheriff Bob, so what have I got to be down about? Well, 
If God is really good, why is all this stuff happening to you? I don't know that yet, but I will. When it's time, I just need to keep doing what's right. <sighs> all right, men, lights out. Another day of quilting tomorrow. <laughs> when I woke up screaming. Well, what does my dream mean, Joe? And mine too. What do they mean? Well, there's good news and there's bad news. You're going back to work today, but you're being sent up the river. Congratulations. So sorry. Uh, anyone here? Oh yes, dear Baker, I have wonderful news. The mayor has given you a full pardon. He wants you to resume your duties immediately. And I'm extending an invitation to you, Mr. Blacksmith, to join my chain gang up the river. <laughs> How do you do that? Hmm? Oh, well, I've always just had this thing for dreams. Just another way God made me special. Uh, yeah, and he loves you very much, uh, I've heard. Little Joe really believed God loved him. Still, every now and then, he'd wonder what God was up to. Hey, God, Little Joe here. Not to complain or anything, but what's going on? I tell people what their dreams mean, and they always come true. But you gave me a dream a long time ago, and I'm in jail, and I didn't even do anything. I'm trying to do what's right, but I'm a little confused. Well, please be with Pa, and baby Benjamin, and most of my brothers. Okay, and Jude too. Good night, God. The very next day, who should show up but the mayor himself? Uh, as I believe we can all see here, uh, the town's reserves are down a good 25% due to the fact that our bank is robbed, on average, every other week. <laughs> hey! Ah, uh, pizza roll? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was horrible, just horrible. And it was so real, like it was really happening. Oh, that sounds dreadful. At any rate, as I was saying about our bank. <laughs> but, but what did it mean? Uh, is there anyone in Dodgeball City who can interpret dreams? Uh, begging the mayor's pardon, but uh, I know someone who might be able to uh, help. My banker tells me you can interpret dreams. No, I can't, sir. What? I can't interpret your dreams, but God can. He'll give me the answer you're looking for. Right. Well, he better, or I'll put you back in that jail and you'll never get out. Let's get started. Earlier today, I had the strangest dream. Seven cows sat on a hill, so big and fat, I got my grill. I was thinking about a barbecue. Then seven scrawny ones came along and gulped the big fat cows were gone. And then I dreamt I was in front of a large group of people in my underwear. What's that about? So come on, start interpreting. Well, it's really quite simple. The seven fat cows mean seven years of plenty are a-coming. More food than you can imagine. And the seven skinny cows mean seven years of terrible famine. Famine so bad, the good years will be all but forgotten. If this is true, what do we do? Well, during the good years, you should store away as much food as possible to give back to the people during the seven bad years. And Dodgeball City will be saved. Of course, you'll need someone with great organizational abilities to make sure it all works. Archie, what's the state of your sock drawer? 
a little disorganized, I'm afraid. That's what I thought. Cucumber, you're in charge. Excuse me. Well, what are you doing standing around here? You've got a city to save. <laughs> <laughs> So the mayor made Little Joe the most powerful man in Dodgeball City. Uh, after him, of course. And just like always, Little Joe got right to it, doing things right and making stuff work. Little Joe, oh Little Joe. got a family out there somewhere. I just hope they're all right. Oh, I'd be surprised if this drought was that widespread. I'm sure they're right as rain. We are doomed! <laughs> Calm down, brothers. Things do look a little bleak. But if we stick together, we'll get through this as a family. Right, Paul? <laughs> we are doomed! For. We hear tell you've got yourself some food stored up. So, we reckon we'd come on down to see if we could buy some from you. Hmm. How many in your family? Just the 11 of us now. One of our brothers got ate up in a wild gopher accident, but that was years ago. Mighty sorry to hear that. We have regretted it every day since. He was my closest brother, and I barely even remember him. Where's your... <clears throat> Where's your pa? He could not make the trip. His heart is broken. <laughs> Y'all see the sheriff. He'll take care of you. Give him whatever they need, but don't let him go till I say so. Are you okay, little Joe? I'm fine, but whatever you do, don't use my name around him. Whatever you say. <sighs> know if my brothers have changed. I need a test. You strangers ready to go? I reckon so. Your man gave us everything we need. We tried to pay, but he would not hear of it. Now I wonder why he wouldn't take money from a bunch of low-down dirty thieves. Pardon? You heard me. You all came a long way just to get caught robbing me. Now see here, we are not thieves. We came to buy some food. But if this is a problem, I... Them ain't pepperonis, partner. There's been a mistake. <laughs> 
You bet there's been a mistake. Your brother tried to steal from me, and we don't take kindly to stealing around these here parts. But you don't understand. My pa has already lost one boy, a boy he loved very much, and it was my fault. I cannot let him lose Benjamin too. Keep me prisoner and let my brother go free. No, 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 no. All right, all right, everybody get out of there. Little Joe, we got a problem. Little Joe? So, you'd really sacrifice yourselves for your brother? It's time to tell you who I really am. Brothers, it's me! <gasps> Little Joe! You are not still upset about that little mineshaft joke, are you? Little Joe, I am to blame for what happened to you. Punish me, but I beg of you, let my brothers go. Hey Jude, what you did was wrong, and it hurt me very much. But what you intended for harm, God used for good, to save you all. To save everyone. To save Pa. How could I not forgive you? Hey! You boys forgot your mittens! <gasps> Little Joe? <gasps> pa! My boy! <laughs> and that's the story of how a very bad thing became a very good thing and led to the happiest family reunion the West had ever seen. Yeah! <laughs> Great, Bob. That was the best Western Bible story I ever heard. Well, thanks, Larry. Uh, we're over here by QWERTY to talk about what we learned today. And so what we have learned applies to our lives today. God has a lot to say in his book. You see, we know that God's word is for everyone. And now that our song is done, we'll take a look. Just a little something I whipped up in cowboy camp. Yahoo. <clears throat> so, what did we learn today? Now, you can learn a lot about a person from their sock drawer. Uh, maybe, but no. You see, good things and bad things happen to everyone. God made little Joe a great organizer. That was good. But his brothers were mean to him, and he ended up in jail for no reason. That was bad. But God can use the good stuff and the bad stuff and put it all together to make something great. Hey, Bob. Let's see if Cordy has a verse for us. Okay. Hey, Cordy, you got anything? Uh, cowboy camp? Got a merit badge for that one. Uh-huh. <laughs> and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. Romans 8, 28. Yep. So, Pete, even though you aren't in the class you wanted to be in, remember that God loves you just as much as he loved little Joe. And if you try to do what's right, you might be amazed at what God has planned for you. Time to go. I gotta get ready for the next show. Uh, where are you going now? Danish Immersion Camp. What? Flav, Girk, Flav. Uh... Remember, God made you special. And that's a good thing. And he loves you very much. And that's a great thing. Goodbye! Goodbye. And now it's time for The Blues with Larry, the part of the show where Larry comes out and sings the blues. Hey, everybody. I'm going to lay down some blues. All sunshine and roses. No rain came my way. I said, all sunshine and roses. No rain came my way. Mm -mm. My dad bought me ice cream. Oh, happy, 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 happy day. Mm -hmm. I ate up that ice cream. Got some on my face. That's right, right on my face. I said, I ate up that ice cream. Got some on. Happy, happy, sticky, happy place. Hey, 
man. What you doing? I'm singing the blues. Oh, man. The blues is for singing when you feel sad. But I don't feel sad. Man, you got no business singing the blues. Here, let me help you out. Take this. Cool, ice cream. Thanks. Now give me back that ice cream. You took my ice cream. You took it from me. You took my ice cream. You took it away from me. Oh, yeah. Now you're getting it. Now listen up. But I'm still not sad. I'll just have a cookie. No, 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 ma'am. You almost had it. Come on, like this. You took away my ice cream. You took it away from me. My sweet, creamy ice cream. I don't care about no cookie. Now try it again. My cookies and ice cream, they both gone away. That's right. Mm -hmm. Feel it. My cookies and ice cream, they both gone away. Oh, sweet, man. Sweet. But that don't bother me none. My freshly baked strudel. What? Strudel? Man, you can't say strudel in the blues. I don't even rhyme. Well, what about poodle? Because I got a poodle. Ha! Oh, no, don't tell me you're going to eat that poodle. No, I'm just going to pet him. Petting poodles makes me happy. <laughs> Sorry, man. You way too happy to sing the blues. Hello. Would you like to poker? Sure. Don't got no ice cream, no cookies, no strudel. Don't got no ice cream, no cookies, no strudel. But I'm your lady, your lady, your lady happy. <laughs> Just here with my poodle. <laughs> That's right. Oh yeah, I'm your lady, your lady, your lady happy too. Just me and my poodle. This has been the Blues with Larry. Tune in next time to... Oh, never mind. Larry's not likely to be singing the blues again anytime soon. And now it's time for Obscure Broadway Show Tunes with Larry, the part of the show where Larry comes out and sings an obscure Broadway show tune. Without further ado, from the unknown musical Office Supplies, the heart-rending love song, Where Have All the Staplers Gone? We don't have much time before the big meeting. No. No, we don't. Have you seen the scissors, miss? They're in the bottom drawer. I tried that drawer, but they're there no more. That's odd. I know I thought for sure. Have you seen the masking tape? It's right next to the phone. Oh, that's what I thought, but now it's not. I guess I should have known oh, oh, where, where have all the staplers gone? What happened to our paper clips? The ballpoint pens are gone again. They're gone again. The, the stick it pads have lost their stick. Do you remember? bands we're in their place they're in the middle drawer light bulbs easy to replace yes there were always more Reads of paper raining down legal pads a plenty highlighters in every hue i remember never less than Where have all the staplers gone? What happened 
Show tunes with Lev. Tune in for Act Two, Revenge of the Staplers. <laughs> oh, oh, hi, kids. I I'm waiting for Larry. I've really missed him. He he's been away at Danish immersion camp for the longest time. Thanks. Have a nice day. Surprise! Is that it? What, is what it? Is anybody else gonna say surprise? Uh, no, Larry, it, it's just me. Oh, well, you know, it's just that normally there's a big group of people who pop up and say surprise at a surprise party. Well, everybody else is getting ready for the show. Oh, and it's a great one, Larry. You're gonna love it. It's- What? Well, coming. Hedgem Larry. It's Welcome Home Larry in Danish. You should know that. How's that? You just spent the last three months in Danish immersion camp. Oh, yeah, well, I didn't exactly go to Danish immersion camp. What? Well, I did, kinda. I mean, I was there for a day, and then me and this kid, Bjorn, took a canoe ride out on the lake and got lost. We ended up at another camp. What camp was that? Overdone British Literary Adaptations Camp. Uh, over what? Overdone British Literary Adaptations Camp. But, but Larry, you were supposed to learn Danish. We were going to do a show about a Danish trucker and his trusty pet monkey. <gasps> like BJ and the Bear? In Danish? Sounds fun. Yes, it does. Except now we can't do it because you can't be Jorgen because you don't know Danish. Who's Jorgen? The trucker. Who's the monkey? Well, it doesn't really matter now, does it? Oh, man! Now what am I gonna tell Chester? Is that the monkey? No! It's the kid we got the letter from that we were gonna do the show for! Well, what's his problem? Here, read this. <clears throat> Dear Bob and Larry, Some of the kids at school make fun of me. They call me names and tell me I'm no good at anything. What should I do? <gasps> oh, dear. Oh, dear is right. The same thing happened to Jorgen and his monkey. But Jorgen decided to take a canoe ride and get lost at Overdone British Literary Adaptation Camp. Hey, wait a minute. I read a story at camp that might be just what Chester needs. It's a classic of British literature called Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, Larry, isn't that story a little scary? Well, sure, if you tell it that way. But if you change things around a little bit, I think we'd have a story Chester would enjoy. Chester, get ready for Dr. Jiggle and Mr. Sly. Huh? Roll film! If one dare listens, then one dare hears a tale to rouse your secret fears. Tell it not, for the end draws nigh. I'm Dr. Jiggle and Mr. Sly.
Your tea, Mr. Butterbun. There'll be no tea today, Pool. There was trouble brewing. Um, there's no trouble brewing, sir. I just heated up some water in it. Not a... the tea, Pool. Not the tea. It's that creature in the alley. There is something wrong with his appearance. Something displeasing. Something downright detestable. Well, I watched him dance last night. He looks a little weird, but he's got some great moves. That's where you're wrong, Pool. Don't let his fancy footwork fool you. Ah, and watch this. The monster is afoot in Dr. Jiggle's house. Quick, Pool, we've got to warn the doctor. Okay. Mr. Butterbun. Dr. Jiggle, thank goodness you're all right. Well, uh, yeah, I... Uh... Well, we've come to warn you. You've an intruder, a detestable disco dancing villain ducked through your back door. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, you must mean Mr. Sly. Mr. Sly? Oh, yeah, man, can that guy dance or what? Yeah, didn't I tell you? That little thing he does with his hips? Uh -huh. He's got to be the best dancer in the whole world. What? You're in cahoots with that creature? Well, yeah. I mean, you gotta like a guy who can dance like that, right? Well, I suppose. I, I know I could never dance like that. I mean, just look at me. I'm too jiggly. Ever since I was a little boy in widely tailored pants, my only aspiration was to be a gourd who danced. But for what it's worth, my portly girth only served to make folks giggle. For the more I moved, the more I proved all I could do was jiggle. I want to dance. I want to grow. I need to feel the rush of the wind under my shoes. I want to dance. What was I saying? Barometer must be rising. Me joints are like an oop. Yep. I think Mr. Sly is great. On account of his non-jiggly, wonderful dancing and all, you guys would really like him. I know you would. Look, Dr. Jiggle, maybe I've been a bit harsh about this Mr. Sly friend of yours. Perhaps I owe him an apology. Would you mind introducing us? Uh, 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 no, I'm afraid that's not possible. You see, he's he's real busy. Uh, but uh, now, if you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I have work to do. No, you know, uh, gotta I do doctor do... stuff. Bye. Good night. Poor Dr. Jiggle. Something tells me he's in trouble, Pool. And I suspect it's no small fault of that new friend of his. I'm going to get to the bottom of this. If he be Mr. Sly, I shall be Mr. Sneak. Huh? Tim, do you have it? Yeah, I got it. Good. Now, remember, you give Mr. Sly the invitation before he starts dancing. Once he finishes, we'll go back to my house and have a nice talk over tea. Then we'll see what he's got up his sleeve. Got it. Okay, go.
11.58. Mr. Sly will be out at any minute. Look, Poole, this may be the last chance we get. Nobody's seen or heard from Dr. Jiggle in two days. No more mamsy pamsy pleasantries. When Sly comes out, we nab him. Pure and simple. Got it? Huh? Dr. Dr. Jiggle! Jiggle! Oh, uh, good evening, gentlemen. I trust you're well, Doctor. Ah, uh, uh, I've been feeling a little woozy lately. Look, Doctor, why don't you join us? We're about to watch your friend dance. It'll do you good to get outside and whip up your circulation. Uh, well, uh, I, uh... Flashy fiend! What have you done with the doctor? I said, what have you done with Dr. Jiggle? What? Those eyes. I know those eyes. Ooh, something so familiar. Could it be? dance lessons. All I ever wanted to do was dance, but I was afraid people would laugh at me for being so jiggly. So you dressed up like that kooky creature so people wouldn't laugh at you? And so people would like me. Y you gotta like a guy who can dance and not jiggle, right? But man, did that costume hurt. I think I bruised my spleen. Dr. Jiggle, we've always liked you. Jiggle and all. Really? You can bet your wacky wig. And I think it's great you've been taking dancing lessons. But you don't need that silly spleen bruise and get up to dance. You're special just the way God made you. Really? Say, that little move you do with your hips. You mind showing a rusty old carrot how it's done? I love that move. I've always loved that move. But I can't do that. Dr. Jigger. Oh. Oh, why not? Great! All right! Oh, I yeah, can't wait to on. see it. It's gonna be split. Stand back. Give him room. I can do it! Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do it. You see, Dr. Jiggle, when you know God made you special, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. You can just be yourself. Though your only aspiration was to be a gourd who danced. But I never knew that I could do in widely tailored pants. But for what it's worth, you poor
your tires. You've got nice chrome, a trailer hitch, left mine at home. Oh, your suspension, it suspends me over heights I've never known. And your roll bar is to die for, by the way, I like your chrome. You already said that. Did I? Yeah. Oh. Oh, you and me in our sport utility. tale. Far, far away in the land of Galoots, where the biggle bag trees bear their biggle bag fruits, and far lily bushes all blossom in yellow, and thin bottle plants squirt snowberry jello. Here where the mountains of Rocky Magoo rise high o'er the meadows of Gilda Manju, where sunsets are painted with purple and blue, you'll find a small town not much bigger than you. Welcome to Snoodleburg, home of the Snoodles. A curious folk who eat pancakes with noodles and spend half their days making sketches and doodles and cutting their hair into shapes like French poodles. Now right in the heart of this curious town is a curious building, the tallest around. With a clock at its top and a chute at its bottom, tis pink in the spring and turns red in the autumn. But weirder by far than its color or height is what happens there every fourth Tuesday night. As strange as it seems, it has been demonstrated that snoodles aren't born, but rather created. Every fourth Tuesday at quarter past nine, the tower will shimmy and rattle and whine, and as the town nibbles on biggle bag fruit, a shiny young snoodle will drop from the chute. That's where they come from, though no one knows why, nor who could have built the great tower so high. These mysteries of life befuddle most snoodles, who'd much rather focus on pancakes and noodles and cutting their hair into shapes like French poodles. Yes, most found the tower too noisy and strange, until one small snoodle made all of that change. This little snoodle was much like the others. He came without siblings, no sisters or brothers. He came without money, a mom or a dad. Uh, the pack on his back was all that he had. This is peculiar, the little guy said. I came from a chute and I fell on my head? 
What do I look like? What am I for? He pondered those questions and then thought of more. Checking my bag is a good place to start. He pulled out some paints. Maybe I'm good at art. The next thing he found was a snoodle kazoo. Hey, what do you know? I can make music too. Then back on his pack, he pulled a small string, and out from the sides popped two little wings. Amazing! He said with a gleam in his eye. I can paint, play kazoo, and now I can fly. Wait till the others see all the great things I can do with my paints, my kazoo, and my wings. So he packed up his paints and his snoodle kazoo, and he hopped off to show them all what he could do. There from the top of a short stubby wall, the big snoodles heard the new small snoodle call. Come watch me, you guys, as I head for the sky. He straightened his wings with a gleam in his eye. Then he jumped and he flapped like the red snoodered finches that fly from the plains to the peak of Mount Ginches. His flight, unlike theirs, Oof. covered only 12 inches. You call that flying? You think you're a bird? We've never seen anything quite so absurd. The old snoodle <laughs> snorted. He sniggered. He shook. I'll paint you a picture to show how you looked. The brush strokes were skillful. The colors were coolish. The story they told made the young one feel foolish. Take it from us, said a snoodle named Lou. Flying just isn't what you're meant to do. The young snoodle drooped. He felt his heart sag. The painting the old snoodle placed in his bag. Carry this with you, the old snoodle said. So visions of flying don't go to your head. The weight on his back was as heavy as lead. So under the weight of the picture he bore, he hobbled along feeling lonely and sore. Till up far ahead on a bench near the tower, he spied a bright bundle of far lily flowers. His heart started lifting. What beautiful things. Then he remembered. I've got more than wings. So quickly, he dug the paints out of his pack and hoped that with art, maybe he'd have the knack. I did it! He yelled to the snoodles in town, then held up his picture as they gathered round. You did it all right, said the snoodles replying. You showed you're no better at painting than flying. Then one of them laughed, and while eating a waffle, painted a picture that made him feel awful. You're puny. You're silly. You're not all that smart. You can't use your wings, and, and you're, you're no good at art. <laughs> that picture, too, was placed in his pack and made his heart slump just as low as his back. I'm ugly. I'm foolish and so very small. I don't think I should be with Snoodles at all. <laughs> and so he decided to get out of town. His wings hung so low that they dragged on the ground. He walked past the tower and out of the city. He walked through the fields and thought, My, this is pretty. The far lily bushes all blooming in yellow, and thimbital plants squirting snowberry jello. I might like it here, said the small snooty fellow. Then feeling some warmth coming back to his chest, he thought he would sit for a moment and rest. But try as he might to sit down with grace, the weight on his back knocked him flat on his face. That's a who? said a voice from behind. A farmer stood up with a thimbuttle vine. Why, you need a picture, my snoodleberg bud, lest you forget how you look in the mud. And so in an instant, the picture was done and placed in his backpack, which now weighed a ton. The poor snoodle struggled. He wobbled, he groaned. He stood to his feet and he said with a moan, is there anywhere I can be truly alone? Just then overhead flew two red snoodered finches, winging their way toward the peak of Mount Ginches. I see, said the snoodle. Then that's what I'll do. The home for those finches will be my home too. So painfully, struggling under his pack, the small snoodle inched up the big mountain's back he crawled over boulders in rain and in lightning. He trudged on and on, though the journey was frightening. 
Till finally on Sunday, at quarter past two, he spied all the meadows of Gilda Manju and realized he was on top of Mount Ginches, alone with the wind and his thoughts and the finches. He thought of the snoodles. He thought of the tower. He thought of the bell that would chime on the hour. He thought of his pack and his very long walk. He thought it so loudly, he heard his thoughts talk. Hello, said his thoughts. You've made quite a climb. That voice, he remarked, doesn't sound much like mine. Then he turned and he noticed he wasn't alone, for a man stood behind near a cave in the stone. He looked like a snoodle, though quite a bit bigger. Maybe a giant, the small snoodle figured. I'm going, the snoodle boy said with a huff. And don't paint a picture, I've got quite enough. But first, come inside, the man said. Have some tea. I'm so very pleased that you're visiting me. The snoodle boy stopped, though he'd only gone inches, and stared at the stranger he'd found on Mount Ginches. He didn't seem angry. In fact, he looked kind. The poor little boy was confused. Are you blind? I'm puny. I'm silly. I'm not all that smart. I can't use my wings and I'm no good at art. The stranger leaned down with a pain in his heart. Who told you these things? He asked. How do you know? These pictures I have in my pack tell me so. The small snoodle sniffled and started to go. First, if you please, let me look at this art. That makes your pack heavy and weighs down your heart. Then picture by picture, he unpacked the bag that bent the poor snoodle and made his wings sag. Dear boy, said the man, these look nothing like you. Then into the fire, the pictures he threw. He rose from his chair saying, wait there, you'll see. But what you need most is a picture from me. The snoodle sat patiently, sipping his tea. Then from a room in the back, he returned and said, Dear little snoodle, it's time that you learned what you really look like. And he threw off the sheet, and what the boy saw warmed him right to his feet. The boy in the portrait looked older and strong, with wings on his back that were sturdy and long and a look in his eye, both courageous and free. Sir? Asked the boy. Are you saying that's me? I like to believe it, but sir, I'm afraid to. But I know who you are, the man said, for I made you. I built the tower and set it in motion. I planted the meadow, put fish in the ocean. And I feed the finches, though most noodles doubt it. Not one of them falls that I don't know about it. I've seen you fall down in the mud and the goo. I've seen all you've done and all you will do. I gave you your pack and your paints and your wings. I chose them for you. They're your special things. The snoodle kazoo is so you can sing about colors in autumn or flowers in spring. I gave you your brushes in hopes that you'd see how using them, you could make pictures for me. Most of the snoodles, the old one said sadly, just use their paints to make others feel badly. The young snoodle pondered the things he'd been told, then wondering something grew suddenly bold. But sir, if you made this incredible land, can't you make snoodles obey your command? The big one smiled warmly, then said to the small, A gift that's demanded is no gift at all. With that, the small snoodle reached into his pack and pulled out the picture he'd made ten miles back. The far lily, sir, from over the bridge. The old one beamed bright and said, That's for my fridge. After the small snoodle's picture was hung, the old one bent down to the face of the young. He said, Here's what you look like. Here's how I see you. Keep this in your pack and you'll find it will free you from all of the pictures and all of the lies that others made up just to cut down your size. And lastly, your wings. 
You know what they're for. But not just to fly, son. I want you to soar. But, sir? Said the Snoodle. How can I fly? This picture's so big, I won't get very high. But this picture's special. It's bigger, it's brighter. Carry it close, and I think you'll feel lighter. As soon as he heard it, the Snoodle looked down and noticed that he was an inch off the ground. He laughed and he leaped and he flew from the cave, feeling now older and stronger and brave. And he flew through the clouds and he flew with the finches. He soared up and down round the peak of Mount Ginches. He flew over far lily bushes in yellow and thin bottle plants squirting snowberry jello. He flew over biggle bag trees and their fruits in big lazy loops for the land of galoots. Then hurried back home to the center of town where the snoodles all stood with their wings on the ground. And starting precisely at quarter past two, he told them the story that I just told you. Bob, did you make that story up yourself? Well, I... That uh... was great! You would have fit in great at camp. Well, I did go to overused literary emulation camp last summer. Oh, yeah! That's right across the road. There was something about that story, though, that made me want to eat green ham. Hmm, well, I, uh... uh anyway, we're over here by Cordy to talk about what we learned today. And so what we have learned applies to our lives today. God has a lot to say in his book. And eggs. Eggs, too. What? Oh, uh... You see, we know that God's word is for everyone. And now that our song is done, we'll take a look. You see, the little Snoodle got weighed down by the pictures of him the others were painting. Just like the names people call us make us feel terrible. But just like the Snoodles, we have a creator. God made us! And when we know what he thinks of us and how he sees us, it doesn't matter what anyone else says. Cordy, can you tell us what the Bible says about us? <laughs> I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139, 14. So, Chester, the kids at school can only see the way you look right now. But God sees you the way you're meant to be. You're stronger, smarter, and braver than you think. And God has given you amazing gifts. You can use your gifts to make the people around you feel better and to do things for God that'll end up on his fridge. Do you know why? Oh, 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 I think I know, Bob. Because God made you special. And he loves you very much. Yep. And he wants you to paint, and he wants you to sing, and he wants you to soar. And maybe even dance. Well, say goodnight, Larry. Farvel. That's Danish for goodbye. Learned that one before the canoe ride. <laughs> Celery, 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 celery,